let's start this up by perhaps introducing yourself. I'm Kenneth Anderson. I'm going to be 55 years old in a matter of a couple of days here. Uh, I've been a long haul trucker for 10 years. I'm off work now. Uh, let me see. Before that, I was living in Vancouver. I worked as a drug and alcohol counselor for a couple of years and also as a um, support care worker in harm reduction with housing for people struggling with homelessness, addiction, and mental health. And that was where I was living when I transitioned, was in the Vancouver area. On this channel, I've only been able to talk to trans men that you know, transitioned back when, like Buck did. Never really got to talk to a trans woman that did it uh, around that time. Mm -hmm. But regardless, I'm always curious to hear um, what it was like for you guys, because obviously you transition at a way different time. So before we dive into that, though, assuming you didn't know anything about trans when you were like 10, can we kind of uh, dig back a little bit and and talk about your you know, upbringing and what it was like, what you were like, um, maybe even any mention of dysphoria or just kind of like before puberty hit kind of stuff. Um, and you don't have to get too detailed just to get kind of an understanding of what your story was like. Right, right. Um, well, I have a, uh, um, I live with um, childhood sexual exploitation. So I'll keep a lot of the details at a surface level that hopefully most people will be comfortable with. Um, for sure, if you are, want more detail, um, feel free to ask. Um, so yeah, I was born in 66. Um, as I said, I'm 55 years old. When I was less than two years old, my mother married a um, convicted pedophile. We were living in a small town in the Maple Ridge area of British Columbia at that time. Um, so she lived with him until I was 13. And, you know, that definitely um, impacted everything because he was uh, what I call a social pedophile. So he had um, all of his friends basically were... Um, pedophiles so um you know that that lived experience has a a deep lasting impact on a person's um developing sense of self and sexuality because you're, you're, you're raised in an environment that is almost completely split into two realities there's the one reality in which the exploitation occurs and then there's the other reality that you showed with the rest of the world right like um gosh probably until i was 10 years old we had to go to church every sunday so we had this one reality going on and that was seen socially by the rest of the world and then a complete different reality that happened in the private context did um did did anyone know about this when it was going on? Well, it was the 1970s um, when most of it occurred. So my other brothers and sisters knew. Um, my aunts and uncles had reason to suspect. Um, my mother had been told by my younger siblings because um, they were. Um, let me see. My sister would have been nine. My other brother. Is there? And, uh, I don't know how easy it would be, but is there? Is there any way to to get you the can thought? Hear her in the background? Yeah. yeah. Just the All right. So I'm just gonna go ahead and ask that again. Uh, that way we don't, because I don't feel like uh, it was getting through anyways. So, okay. um, so how did all of that uh, affect you? That as far as you can remember, and, and did anybody know? Um. Yeah, well, it it split the world into basically two realities. Um, the reality at home where the sexual exploitation occurred and then the social reality whenever we were outside at school, at church, um, at which we were this Christian family. 
Um, my older siblings, uh, my brother Brian would have been about 13, then uh, 12 and 10 when my mother married Jean. So they certainly told her um, that things were going on and um, she chose not to believe them. Um, and that was her, that was her default. The kind way we talk about it amongst my family is we say that her mother didn't have an intimate relationship with reality. Basically, if she didn't want to know something, then she denied that it happened or existed. It was a really strange context um, growing up in. Uh, I remember when I was, oh gosh, I would have been in my late 20s, early 30s, um, getting drug and alcohol counseling, um, talking to the counselor about my biological father being an alcoholic. And they were like, oh, that must have been so traumatic. And I was like, yeah, no, the pedophile was traumatic. The alcoholic after that was easy to live with because... My mom divorced my dad when I was less than two, and then uh, before my 14th birthday, they got back together. Um, yeah. Um, I don't... Explain that to people, but yeah. Sorry, I uh, I, I don't want to interview you and, and dig so deep that it makes this interview uncomfortable for you, um, to, oh, yeah. just to be clear, you know, share what you're yeah. comfortable with, but I, what I did kind of um, just put out there, so basically... You know, your dad was abusive. Um, he left and came back. So is it, I guess, safe to assume that as long as he was present in your life, that just continuously happened and your mom wasn't really aware? Um, no, the stepdad um, was the one who was the pedophile. Um, okay, yes. Uh, sorry, that's what I meant. But but as long yeah. as he was around. Yeah, my mom would just deny it happening or occurring. Yeah. And and um, the other thing she would do is say that um, if she divorced him, we'd have to be poor and be on welfare. And um, she'd talk about money issues or all the things we had. She was a very broken person. Um, yeah. In, in, in that um, sense. But I suspect strongly that she also grew up in a home in which... Um, sexual abuse was normalized in a specific context yeah. i'm not an expert in this by any means but something that i've often noticed is the patterns in which someone is abused and then they somehow always not always i shouldn't say always but um when a person is abused or grows up in that environment it's really hard for them to come out of it not um you know, damaged by it in any, any way to where they're now vulnerable to again, repeat that pattern of somehow ending up in another environment where there is uh, somebody that's abusing them or somebody that they love. Now, I'm not saying yeah. this is the case for everyone, but I certainly have noticed that this happens over and over again. And I don't, I don't personally blame the, you know, uh, your mom or, or anybody in, in that circumstance to where they were abused and they, you know, were affected negatively by it, obviously. I think it's, I mean, I can't imagine what that's like, but I don't think it's uncommon is, is what I'm saying. Yeah, it's, it's, it, there was definitely a social context in which it occurred, right? Because you know, I don't really know how to explain the 60s and the 70s to two people today, but um, like Gene, uh, when he got out of prison, I believe that was his second charge of pedophilia. Um, and there was no list he was written on. There was nothing he had to report to. There, there were none of the controls that um, society attempts to place upon um, sexual offenders today. Um, and even when I was, um, so fourth grade, so six and 10, so 10 to 11 years old, um, he was, a, he was charged with sexually abusing a friend of mine and, um, he was convicted. And so get this, um, he was given uh, a weekend sentence 
because he had a wife and children to support so that he could continue working. Um, and that would have been mid 70s, 73, yeah, 74, yeah, 10. So uh, I guess 75, 76. Um, but that certainly isn't the way that situation would be handled today, right? Hmm. Um, not, not well, not necessarily, but well, also, yeah. you know, depending where you're at, it, it's kind of crazy how little time some of them get. Yeah, yeah. Um, so eventually he did get um, life in prison in the United States without parole. Um, whether he's alive today or not, um, he'll never see the outside of a jail again, which is good news. And not that I want to get into only talking about like ped pedophilia, but it's really telling that we're at a point um, today where we're talking about um, destigmatizing uh, what we refer to pedophiles, you know, sometimes calling them a minor attracted person, um, yeah. otherwise known as MAPS. Yes. And, 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 and I'm bringing this up because, you know, this is the first, uh, this is what we're thinking about should be discussed in terms of pedophiles to destig mm -hmm. destigmatize it a bit so that they can get support, which I don't think, I think most people will probably, will probably be on board with, there should be support for pedophiles, but that doesn't mean that it gets destigmatized and normalized or anything like that. But also no. what, I, what I'm trying to get at is we'd rather focus on destigmatizing pedophiles than looking at why do pedophiles get in and out of prison? Why do they get to do it twice, four times? Yeah before they eventually get life in prison. That yeah. to me is way more important than, you know, making a pedophile feel not guilty or bad or shameful because they're a pedophile, yeah. which is really kind of what stuck out when you were talking about this. It's like, man, it's so bizarre. Uh, the things that, the causes that we want to focus on now, you know, mm -hmm. um, and completely ignore the victims of pedophiles. So, yeah. but, uh, moving moving forward from there, though, because like I said, I don't want to sit on that. Um, but thank you for for opening up about that. Obviously, that's probably not an easy subject for for you to get into. Um, and I imagine, you know, if if you ever recall that you were already uncomfortable or dysphoric prior to that, or if you, I, I don't know if that would even be a fair a question to ask. I, I'm just wondering. I think that's a good question. Yeah. Um, I would say in my early childhood, so you're talking about um, up to about 10 years old, um, the type of dysphoria I experienced was specifically when I went to bed. So I would imagine that if I could hide completely under the covers, I would entirely disappear. And it was when, when I had been lying still long enough that you know how your body equalizes in temperature and you'll get that feeling of not feeling kind of a sensation like nothing feels hotter nothing feels colder the sheets were flannel so they both start then i could fall asleep yeah. so it, it 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 was almost a um dissociative type of feeling that i would need to relax enough to go to bed um and there were places where if I couldn't get that experience, then I would have to crawl under the bed to sleep. But that dissociative um, sense of not of who of me not being my body, yeah, that definitely started as part of the abuse. Yes. Okay. And then, um, I guess to just move a little bit forward into your story, obviously that was the first time, like you just said. Um, but at what point did it resurface again in a way to where you uh, started thinking that it was dysphoria? And maybe it was. I'm, I'm just asking. My disassociation with myself as a female um, and then as a maturing sexual individual would have started around um, the age of 12 when I had my first menses. Uh, because that was the age at which um, Jean, who was the stepfather, 
began talking about their he, he was sexually attracted to children specifically between about the age of five and ten. So I was getting too old. Um, so he became obsessed with this idea of breeding me so he could have children forever and ever and ever. Um, and that's when the idea of me being female and female body began to seem like a curse. And if only I wasn't this thing, um, then this wouldn't be happening. Um, the uh, show, The Love Boat, um, was on and they had this episode where Gopher's friend, he had a male friend who transitioned in one of their episodes. And that was when this idea to me that if only I could be a male um, entered into my brain. Um, the response I was given was that um, it, it, if I did this, uh, Gene was like, oh, if you did that, you'd never orgasm again. And I really didn't understand what an orgasm was through personal experience, but I understood the extent at which these men would go to have one. Um, so it seemed like it might be something I wouldn't want to give up. It seemed um, like something you wouldn't, wouldn't want to give up? Is that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, um, you, you mentioned, uh, so, so you were talking to Gene about this uh, transition, but when you were thinking of it? Um, I didn't even think or call it transition then, but it was this idea that I could, if I could be a boy rather than a girl, um, everything would get better. I didn't understand it as being okay. Crazy. So these were, I, I guess I'm just asking because you mentioned, yeah, yeah, no, I was just asking, um, you mentioned Gene, so I was curious if you were sharing this information with him. So yeah, when I talked about him being divided into like two different realities, two different people, um, so it was like there was a switch in him and he went from being a really nice person to being a monster. Um, so yeah, there were, when he was being nice, there were things that I was more comfortable talking to him about than talking to my mom. And of course, my mom trying to talk about anything sexual she just freaked right out um which was part of her denial i guess of everything that was going on um yeah so as paradoxical as it seems it was him that i talked to about yeah. that so this was uh something you came across but obviously you didn't know it was transition or, or you didn't know that's what it was called you probably still didn't know what dysphoria was so you just stumbled across it and you knew of it, but you didn't, uh, obviously back then the internet wasn't as accessible. So you didn't just run to find it on the internet. Right. So oh, at, yeah. this was the 1980s. So. Yeah. So at this point uh, we could assume that you stumbled across the idea. It might've maybe planted a seed in your head, but you didn't do anything about it till later on. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Like, okay. Um, as a child and I'll keep this light. Um, Gene would take me to what I call pedophile parties. So this would be a gathering of his male friends, possibly their wives, they'd bring their children. And it didn't dawn on me um, until last year that the men who were there who were dressed in skirts or dresses and makeup would have possibly been transgendered identified. To me, for 54 years, they were just men dressed in dresses. Um, so, yeah, this, um, this idea that I would say it was in, I would say it was in my thirties that this understanding of, um, living in a sexual role different from the one you have been um, born into, like being a male rather than a female, actually entered into my reality and entered into my head as a reality of something people actually do. Yeah. Um, and that was in a uh, social context. I met a person who had transitioned male to female. Mm -hmm. 
not going to lie. It's hard to hear some of this stuff and not get upset. <laughs> I'm sure you've <laughs> obviously made your peace with it. Um, but it's a uh, pretty heavy hearing this, uh, really, really pisses me off. Um, cause you seem like a, obviously a decent person and somehow a sane person after everything. So, um, I, I'm curious because of all of this stuff happening uh, in terms of, you know, feeling disassociated with your body, uh, realizing that, you know, people can transition. And then this confusion over probably, I assume, you know, your sexuality. At what point before you transitioned or before you stumbled across what dysphoria was, did you get an opportunity to explore your sexual orientation or comfort in that at all? Ooh, um, I have never been in a sexual relationship where I haven't been either drinking or using drugs. Um, so I would have met my first girlfriend when I was uh, 21. Um, we lived together for two and a half years. And then uh, I lived here uh, two, three years later. I moved up to the Yukon Territories and I lived in a, in a very abusive relationship with a woman almost 19 years older than me. We were together for three and a half years. Um, it was an alcohol extreme. She was a star grade in Allen Honor. Um, and I, I never had to worry about anything. I even had a budget for my alcohol. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then after I split up with her, um, two years later, I got together with a woman who was heavy into marijuana and recreational drugs. And we were together for almost 10 years. And then um, a year after we broke up, um, I got sober and I've been basically single and sober since then. I have dated a couple times, um, but somewhere along the line, I recognized that um, the problem I had in relationships wasn't about the other person, it was about me. And um, like the abuse, the sexual abuse started when I was two years old. And I think that the younger you are when the abuse starts, the less the less skills like you develop, right? As far as um, being in relationship, um, right? So when I'm in a relationship, it just becomes um, really stressful just for me to be present. And the longer I'm in the relationship, the more I disassociate even drinking and using drugs, the more heavily um, I use and the more difficult um, sex becomes. I think that's the biggest part of um, having transitioned for me is just the comfort I have now that I'm no longer subject to um, sexuality. Like, um, I don't get approached by men sexually, right? Yeah, um, some young guys will hit at me, hit on me, but they're very tentative and mm -hmm. they tend to respect no very quickly. Um, so that's definitely a huge part of why, even though I've come to a place of, um, stopping and going I didn't really have to do this I can't see myself going back because there is no going backwards after um, certain physical changes that go on in the body yeah. um, can't be undone like all I'd ever look like now is a really ugly woman right and it's kind of okay well now. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that <laughs> I don't think <laughs> I don't think uh, that's a fair point we don't just look like ugly women I don't think we were ever ugly women I do think that we believe we were um but I don't yes. I don't I won't let you say yeah. that on here because it's not true <laughs> okay yeah, um, yeah. Uh, yeah I guess it's that like I I recognize now when I see pictures of myself when I was younger that I was very pretty 
but exactly what you were talking about, Dan, at, the, at that time, I definitely saw myself as very ugly. I had a really hard time probably um the third to fourth years was in uh transitioning as i started to feel really bald um because my stepdad was bald um so one day i came home from the barber and i realized i had a comb over, comb over and that's that was his hairstyle um so i went to my best friends and she helped me shave my head because i couldn't handle looking like him at all and i've been pretty much shaved that ever since then um yeah how did we get to this from the question you asked but yeah no we went we went a little bit further into there but but that's totally fine um i i do want to go back to well let me just make this point so because of everything you dealt with um which i'm sure other people who have been abused can probably relate to your story your perception of sexuality like what yours was and um, the relationships that you tried to build were all pretty dysfunctional because you were never at peace and comfortable with your body because of everything that happened. Yeah. So it doesn't even sound like you really questioned sexual orientation very much. It sounded like you were just blackout dating basically to, to, to get through it. I struggled with hypersexuality um, from probably 15 to 16 when I started to masturbate um I mean I think of it as hypersexuality because I would like masturbate daily um which at that time I was um I had a very um conservative um you know bible belt understanding of a relationship with who or what God was um today my understanding is very different um so being attracted to females was definitely this idea that i was going to rot in hell forever even though all i was doing was like you know masturbating um so i did not i didn't date at all in high school i didn't start dating until i was going to college and then um i ended up living for you know, two and a half, three years with the first woman I ever dated. Um, so there was definitely this idea that if you had sex with someone, then it had to be this forever and ever I think. Yeah. And there was, it sounds like, um, correct me if I'm wrong, like there was discomfort, maybe disgust in the potential of being attracted to women and perhaps being a lesbian. Yeah. Which was it just stemming from the religious teachings or would you say that around that time did you perceive lesbians to be disgusting i don't i hope that's a fair question i'm just no wondering. yeah I, I'm, I'm understanding the difference yeah it was definitely about me it wasn't about other um lesbians or about other women it was this idea of there is something within me that is so evil that every um everyone I touch um, in a sexual way is tarnished by this, this evil inside of me. Um, it took until my, uh, so it's going on 20 years. So yeah, it would have been my mid thirties um, before that really changed. And a big part of that was qualifying for almost a year of inpatient drug and alcohol therapy. So yeah, it took a lot of counseling to change that understanding of myself. I yeah, know, no doubt. Um, I do want to get back to you, the transition part of your story, but I want to ask one more question related to the pedophilia and because you've dealt with it firsthand. Do you think that, that what's going on with uh, the trans community, there is any sort of connection there to that? Because we, or not we, but uh, I've had these conversations recently in Twitter spaces and talked about how the pornography uh, is an issue, right? But also the way that some male adults who identify as trans women, not all of them, sometimes some of them, might want to identify as a young girl 
or how some men are attracted to the idea of a female to male who gets top surgery, but maybe doesn't medically transition otherwise, because they look, in my opinion, like a 12 year old. Do you ever, have you seen this? And do you think that this is kind of disturbing and remotely close to what you've seen in your past? Yes. <laughs> um, the, the short and easy question is yes. Like when I, I was recently reading the stuff about Michael Foucault and how he was, um, what's the word they used, haunted during his lifetime of accusations of being, of ha buying sex with minor boys, right? And I mean, so much of this, like he's their um, prophet, right? Um, and also just um, the way Soji grooms children for dysphoria is very similar to um, the type of behavior that Gene engaged in, like the the separation into the two realities. Okay, this will go on at school. Will will you're I, you you're you're a little boy and your name is Johnny. Um, but we're gonna you know there'll be dresses you can put on when you get to school and everybody will call you Sally. Um, Gene, um, I called it, um, it never happened. So, um, so let's say it's Sunday morning and, um, mom's probably passed out in bed from the drugs he gave her. So we're sitting on the couch watching TV, um, cartoons, whatever. So he would ask me questions about what happened at the pedophile party the night before, and I would answer truthfully. And then he would take his leg and he would slap me on my thigh and say, you're a liar, that never happened. And then he'd ask me the same question again. So it was this separating into two realities, okay? That happened there within the context of the pedophilia. This is the home, this is the social place, this is where we're good little Christians, sex doesn't happen, blowjobs don't happen. Hand jobs don't happen. None yeah. of that happens in this context. Hmm. Um, and I see that um, grooming, not in that severe of a form, but in the milder forms that occur yeah. that create that separation. I very much see that. And that is what disturbs me the most about um, the Soji teachings, the, what is it, sexual orientation, gender identity stuff, mm -hmm. is this idea that um, we don't need to tell your parents. Yeah. We don't need to tell your mother. Um, like my Annie Joy um, was involved in um, volunteering new people in the RCMP up in Canada, um, was involved in um, political activism, stuff like that, like not radically or anything, but, you know, um, do not tell your Auntie Joy. <laughs> yeah. It was like, um, so... Yeah, it's the we don't have to tell your parents. It's the we don't have to tell other people. It's that um, division and secrecy and only we understand you. Um, and I guess that, yeah, I mean, for sure, that's why, like, as a child, um, when I had questions about sexuality, that was why I asked him, you know, like, when I was 12 years old and pregnant, I certainly didn't tell my mother. Um I told him, and he really don't remember very much of what happened because they uh, used a combination of drugs to induce an abortion, like they induced a miscarriage. Um, I mean, we're talking 1978, small town USA. Um, so, like, I think most young girls, if they were pregnant, would tell their mother, not their father, right? Um, but that was just... It was something that happened because of sex, so he was the only safe person in my reality to talk to about it. And that's how, um, you know, that's definitely what they're doing with the Soji, with the, um, oh, this can happen at school, you don't have to tell your parents. Um, yeah. And it just, um, it's creepy. It is creepy. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah no, it's absolutely. Um, 
it's like the idea that a little boy who tells you he's a girl at the age of four, you tell them that he's right. He was never a little boy because your sex was just this assignment that a doctor came up with, not based on observed sex at all. So there is that, you know, um, disconnect there, or that's what they're trying to do is like you said, separating reality and building this idea and putting it in a child's head, which obviously it worked for you, right? Like you believe these things until your brain matures and you're able to actually realize what is reality and what isn't, what was the truth and what wasn't, you know? Yeah. So that's a, yeah, no, I, I really just wanted to ask to get your input and uh, your perspective, obviously, on that because of everything that you've stated here. Um, yeah, yeah, that to me is the scariest part of the new um, conversion therapy bill that's being brought forward in Canada, right? Yeah. Because under the bill, the way it's written, um, conversion therapy only goes one direction. So under the if this bill goes forward as written the next step will be the criminalization of the terms boy and girl because they've got this whole assigned at birth um mythology going on right the idea that sex cannot be observed it can only be assigned um on some sort of false basis so um that was when i i was briefly involved with a uh, Advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. Sorry, when I get emotional, words get a little difficult. But um, here in Saskatchewan, and they were talking about this idea of criminalizing the terms boy and girl because that's um, conversion therapy. Yeah, that's what scares me about this bill. Mm -hmm. um, what, if it were written both ways, you know, you cannot convert a child into being. Um, it just goes one direction so it right. leaves the it leaves the other path open yeah. um, which as far as i can tell the extremists intend to take complete advantage of mm -hmm. yeah yeah and that's a that's a problem is redefining what a male and female is redefining what conversion therapy is and mm -hmm. once that's redefined it's going to be nearly impossible to to fight fight them on this because they would just go to well didn't you check and see the meaning of this, right? The dictionary states that conversion therapy is actually any sort of exploratory therapy uh, on, a, on a dysphoric child. That's, that's where I, it freaks me out because that, that's what they've been doing over the past few years is, you know, you look at, in some dictionaries, you look up the word, um, you look up woman and yeah. it's not just, you know, an adult human female anymore. There's always an additional uh, definition there because they want to include other meanings that actually don't have anything to do with a female um, but but they're there so it, it is a as they like to say a slippery slope um, so uh, but kind of I could, I could I could talk about that slippery slope all day um, but we'll go back to your story because I, I do want to you know get to uh, the transition part of it which I'm really curious how you came about, uh, you know, discovering dysphoria and then just deciding to transition. Mm. What, where, where did that happen? Or at what point in your life did that happen? And how did you even get this information that, and then, and then actually, I don't want to ask you too many questions at once, but so let's just start off with like, how did you stumble across this idea to transition and dysphoria? Um, after meeting the MTAF, um, who had transitioned, um, I began to fantasize about this idea that if I could present to the world as a male, um, everything that made me uncomfortable would just magically go away. Um, and, um, one morning I was lying in bed and I was thinking, well, why don't I just do this? Um, 
and then uh what was it a week or so later the next time i had an appointment with my drug and alcohol counselor i talked to her about it and she was definitely on the um affirmations model so she didn't question the idea at all she completely affirmed it like if people have these questions if people feel this way then they're transgendered and um, she started introducing me to the terminology and just definitely affirmed that, you know, this is what it was, this is what it meant. Um, in her defense at that time, um, I had been a counselor probably for about a year and a half. Um, so it's not like she lacked a lot of my background, um, but she definitely lacked um, any further exploration into how does this relate to um sorry about that how does this relate to the abuse that you survived or how does this relate to um you know your inability to stay in a relationship sober yeah. or um any of those complex questions a uh, doctor i had been seeing um as part of my um alcohol and drug therapy um he had worked with a lot of people who transitioned who had a history of alcoholism um and he asked me like okay so are you wanting to be in a heterosexual relationship with a woman is that what this is about um are you wanting to be in a gay relationship with a man like what is how does this relate to um your sexuality, how will changing your sexual, the, your gender presentation, how will that, how will you interact that into your life as a sexual human being? Because you're an adult um, human being in your mid thirties, you have sexual feelings. Um, and I was uncomfortable with all of those questions and I really had no answer to any of them. And uh, when I went back the next week and talked with my alcohol and drug therapist about it, she's like, oh, that person's just transphobic. They have no understanding of um, what transition is going about. So I stopped seeing him. Um, my psychiatrist, um, he asked me a lot of questions too. Um, but I don't know, like, I made the decision at that time to stop seeing my alcohol and drug therapist rather than um, the psychiatrist. And we continued to work together for the first year of my transition. Um, but I mostly found that the affirmations model stuff didn't ask any questions they just it was just affirm 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 if this is how you feel then this has to be real um and looking back on it that was not helpful um because yeah. i mean you know 16 years past transition when everything fell apart it was all of the questions the doctors asked me that helped me um, get my feet back under me. Like I had been involved in BC with trans, with what's now called um, trans radical activists. And when I started getting um, disillusioned with all of that, um, this whole idea of um, I don't even think they've gotten as far as the assigned male and assigned female at birth, but this whole idea that um, if somebody wants to transition, they shouldn't be questioned. There should be no no blockades to doing this. And mm -hmm. uh, people are born trans. It's what needs to be changed is everybody needs to be allowed to transition at the earliest stage possible. This isn't about social acceptance. It's about medicalizing the child. Um, and then I just kind of walked away from it. I also had an experience where you know, there was this woman I knew um, and we'd been friends for a while and I told her I'd like to date her. And she said, well, 
I'm not attracted to men. I'm only attracted to women. So realizing in that moment that um, I'm sexually attracted to women who are sexually attracted to women. And that um, that moment of understanding just kind of burst a little bubble that I'd gotten into this whole social justice stuff. And I just saw it as pretty much a pile of bullshit. Yeah. Um, and that, um, that was just, I mean, two weeks later, three weeks later, I was, uh, I designed my job working in uh, support care. <laughs> I was driving a truck in uh, Calgary. Mm-hmm. <laughs> my brother drove me out to Calgary and I hopped in a truck and went truck driving uh, and just kind of left that all behind until yeah. I started talking to Aaron maybe he was about what. I guess it was just around when the whole COVID thing started. Yeah. And then he started the whole gender dysphoria alliance. Came into the end, but yeah. So Which was, was a brilliant cool. idea. So thank you to you and, and Aaron for coming up with it. Um, because honestly, we need something to counter the lies. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And you guys mm-hmm. have been in it for a while, much longer than I have. So it really does help to add perspective to everything that that you know that's going on um i do want to kind of jump back a little bit to uh your transition um what was that like the first before you said you know um i'm i'm attracted to women and technically i'm a, I'm a woman like you know and you had that moment was there how, how radical would you say you got into it did you believe immediately when you started transition that your entire life, the issue was dysphoria. Um, did you believe that you could change sex? Like how, how deep in it were you um, oh, before you no. kind of woke up to realizing, hang on a second, this isn't, this isn't actually true. The biggest um, problem I had socially with people who knew me during the transitional stage was like, my name's Kelly. Um, and then you met me as Kelly years ago and um I, when they asked me if they needed to call me kenneth or he or anything like that i was just like yeah no go with whatever you're comfortable with so um my one friend sue um her girlfriends were telling her that she couldn't call me kelly and she couldn't call me she um that she had to call me he and had to call me kenneth and i was like yeah why um so I was kind of in the flip side of going, well, this, I understood at a level that this like visual that you see is a presentation that makes me feel comfortable when I'm out in the world. Um, it had not, like, I never asked any of my family to call me New York and I still have them. Um, I've actually explained to a lot of them that, yeah, no, this has nothing to do with you. Um, So I always had that type of a level of understanding. Um, So no, I never felt like I had been born a boy in the wrong body, although I certainly um, talked the talk to to get through the next step of the, um, oh, come on, what's the word for it? Um, The assessment process to get um surgery or to get the letter yeah. uh, back in those old days you needed a carry letter um when your gender presentation conflicted with what all your id said and that sort of stuff yeah um but as far as um in my social field yeah no and i found myself like um, the last recovery house i was in was run by a um, radical femme so the first time I was seen out in public um, with a mustache on, um, it was during the weekend. And so one of the women living in the house told um, the executive director that she had seen me um, dressed as male. So um, she phoned me at home and said, like, you know, uh, it's been reported <laughs> that you've been seen <laughs> in public uh, as a male. Have you yeah. joined a uh, 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 drag kings troop? 
and were you just you know on your way home from working out or whatever and I was like yeah no I'm just you know exploring my um gender and wondering if I want to transition or whatever right and so she was like okay we'll send you your last check in the mail and you understand you can never come onto the property again and we'll make arrangements for anything to have on site because I used to do the um overnight shift hmm. so you'd go there you'd report there yeah all the women would go to bed you'd go to sleep you'd wake up an hour before then um so yeah I was never welcomed on the property again so I had that happening in one field and then in another social context, um, I had a lot of gay men friends. So them watching me get kicked out of all of the lesbian groups that I had been hanging around with or watching me struggling in um, social contacts with um, lesbians were like, well, you can come into you know, our group, we have this going on, we have that going on. They started inviting me out for coffee or like just social gatherings that they were doing with friends. Um, so I felt like I was kind of propelled into a single direction that I wasn't even sure I wanted to go in yet, but I didn't want to be alone because me and addiction and alone are not not good things. Right. So um, I accepted the office friendship that the friend presented to me. And also, um, the other thing that was a relief is hanging out with the gay guys. They didn't care if I wanted to be called Kelly or Ken. They called me he and she and were like, are you okay with that? And I'm like, I'm fine with that. So, you know, just that relief of not having to um, either defend my position or telling people constantly what I prefer. <laughs> like, whoa, um, you want to send me into a panic attack? Ask them for preference. Uh. <laughs> yeah same like, i know <laughs> yeah it's like some some people that uh, take actually some some lady said it best uh yesterday in the twitter space she's a teacher and she said you know if you're introducing yourself and all i hear is word salad or something like that and i'm like that is such a great way to put it <laughs> it really is when you're taking like a whole minute to introduce yourself because you're getting through all these identities and, and pronouns. Yeah, it's fair to say that's word salad. So, no, no, that's why I I, I got uh, I had a pronoun discussion with someone and I thought, okay, I, me, mine, it, myself, because I'm not going to mispronoun myself. And I <laughs> yeah. Never miss yeah. Pronoun myself. Right. Exactly. Anyway, that's mine, and I got the pronoun right. So, mm. if you want to talk about me, go for it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Um I guess um to kind of get towards I don't know if it's fair to say the end of your transition, but I want to get into what your view is of your transition now. Um knowing everything. Do you look at it and think, you know, uh, it was the abuse that led to my transition and the experts failed me or did the abuse actually give you some levels of dysphoria and was at least that diagnosis of dysphoria correct in any sort of way or, or, or what do you think of, you see what I'm saying? Well, yeah. And I'm of the position that everything I have experienced in my life has of course affected me. It has, um, it's like a tree, right? Um, when I was born, I was a seed. And as that seed grew, um, the adults in my life cut off branches. So the directions in which I was left to grow were influenced by the branches that were cut off, right? Um, did the, did the, um, sexual exploitation affect my decisions regarding my sexuality? Of course it did. You know, to say to say it didn't is, for me to say it didn't is ridiculous because it was sexual exploitation. Um, it affected the ways I felt comfortable being sexual. It affected the ways and, um, you know, I've never felt comfortable having an orgasm with another person um, unless I have my clothes on. Right. So the sexual exploitation 
definitely impacted that. Um, so yeah, the sexual exploitation definitely impacted my transition because it was all about erasing the external markers that indicated to the world that I was female. And that's, um, that's all it's about today, right? Is that um, males in general, heterosexual males specifically, no longer approach me in any sort of sexual way. Mm -hmm. And um, how can I, how can I be truthful um, with another person and deny that that had anything to do with the sexual exploitation? I mean, that's, I see the relationship between those two things as pretty much one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I mean... Even now, with all of my understanding of myself, I still can't see myself um, being able to have a relationship with a man um, because of the abuse. Um, and I don't know that I will ever be in a relationship. And I mean, I'm in my mid fifties. The the drive to couple lessons as you get older and social needs um change with age so you know that's not the same tragedy in your mid 50s that it would have been in your early 20s um so yeah i, I definitely see the two things as um related and I, I i definitely think that the manner in which a person is affected by sexual exploitation um is very much influenced by the age at which it happens and also influenced by how um, the people within their intimate social group respond to it, right? Like my mother's response was, uh, this is something she didn't pull and hide it. Um, so that definitely Im impacted how I experienced developed um, and felt about uh, myself and my body as I grew and became a sexual being, right? So there was always this sense of this is something shameful and hide it. Thank you so much for um, sharing your story today. I know that it was obviously emotional for you, um, but I really appreciate it. And I know that a lot of people will get so much out of this because it's really important because you're talking about your transition and how somebody just kind of affirmed you, even though they knew about the sexual abuse. And I still see this an issue, being an issue today. So it's mm -hmm. really, really important to raise awareness on uh, a female that has sexual abuse will obviously grow up to have issues with her sexual sexuality, her body. So we probably shouldn't affirm them, yet it's still happening today. You know, we see this on, I've seen it many times. I don't know how much uh, you watch YouTube, but there's at least two uh, female to males, one of which has detransitioned and fully transitioned with bottom surgery and everything. Um, they detransitioned and realized that a lot of it was the sexual trauma that they have. There's another one on there that also talks about, I mean, they're still transitioning, but it's really alarming that they're coming in it from, you know, they had abuse with their, uh, and obviously that affected them. They don't feel comfortable with their body. They develop the dysphoria or what they think is dysphoria and they get affirmed. Mm -hmm. And I guess the last question I want to ask you is why do you think they're still getting affirmed when it should be pretty clear with, you know, you transitioning for different reasons or wrong reasons, however you want to refer to it 15 years or so ago, why is it still happening today? Why are we saying affirm them even though the sexual abuse is there and this could be a mistake. Hmm. Um, I think I'm going to take, take a step back and then answer your question. Um, mm -hmm. I, like I had to go through the um, social support groups. That was part of the, oh, what do they call that model? Um, peer, peer support model that was developing as part of the affirmative care. And in my peer support groups, they told me, oh, you can't talk about your sexual abuse. Like, 
Never let Dr. Blanchard know that you were sexually abused. You'll never get approval for surgeries. Do not talk to Dr. Knutson if you have to go to see her about sexual abuse. Like you just, you don't get to transition if you've been sexually abused. Mm -hmm. So there was an absolute silencing of that um, by the people in the, what they call it, the trans, that was a, a group with male to female and female to male, um, trans people who were transitioning in it. Um, and then I found out recently that the F to M specific group that I went to um, was started by two people who both um, went into, um, they both struggled with what they call issues of sexual addic addiction. And that group was all about, are you watching porn yet? Um, so there seems to be this idea where there, there are those who feel a sense of relief that it's no longer being talked about, right? Like there, when I went through it, there was a silencing and now it's not even being addressed anymore. And I definitely think it goes way back to the question we asked early in the beginning and do you see a relationship between what's going on and grooming children for transitioning and grooming children as part of sexual abuse? So, yeah, yeah it's uh, don't talk about it. It's shameful. And there's nothing shameful um, about having been sexually abused. There's nothing shameful about surviving sexual exploitation. And I don't call myself a survivor anymore because this whole um survivor cult has opened up that i'm seeing as becoming just as unhealthy as the other stuff so it's a history i lived through it um and today i live with that history and i live with the impact of that history on my life and i can understand and see how it affects uh, my choices today um so yeah um it almost goes hand in hand with the grooming situation that's going on. And maybe it's about, I think if people talked about it more, they would begin to see more of the parallels um, between what the extremists are advocating for and um, what people who sexually exploit children do. So um, yeah, I definitely don't see it as a good thing. Yeah. No, that was a great way to put it. Um, we'll wrap it up on that note. And move over to Patreon, if that's cool with you, because uh, I definitely think that we need a sort of lighthearted conversation after this one. Um, so, yeah, if you're if you're interested and want to see that conversation, uh, I'll put the link in the description down below. Uh, Kenneth, okay. if there's any links you want me to put for anyone to maybe DM you or anything like that, uh, let me know and I'll put that down below. Um, otherwise... Mm -hmm. It's been it's been truly like awesome having you on my channel. I know it's been a while. I tried to get you on like months ago. Um, so I was I was I was glad that your schedule was open finally. Um, and uh, yeah, I can't thank you enough for being so open about your past and and so real realistic about you know the outcomes of transition. Which when you talk about today, obviously it makes you uh, a transphobe or, or whatever they want to call you. But I, yeah. I think I think you're super courageous so for, for sharing this openly. So I really appreciate you. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. And as usual, everybody, until next time, take it easy. Peace.